Welcome, my name is Terry Soul, and this is Programming Chaos, a channel devoted to fun and interesting programming projects to help you hone your programming skills. Today's project is the Sierpinski Triangle, also known sometimes as Sierpinski Gasket or Sierpinski Sieve. It's one of the classic fractal shapes. So as you can see here, it consists of a large triangle with three smaller triangles drawn around it. And then each of those triangles has successively smaller and smaller triangles around it, making it a fractal shape. It repeats at different scales. And not surprisingly, we're gonna program it using recursion. So we're gonna write a triangle function that draws a triangle and then calls itself to draw the three smaller triangles around it. And because it's calling itself, each of those triangles draws three smaller triangles and so forth. And then we'll put our own little spin on it just to make it more interesting. Now, before we start the coding, we should do a little bit of geometry to make sure that we get the sizes and the positioning correct for the triangles. And I'm gonna do mine in a slightly different way for reasons that will become apparent. I'm gonna focus on making a triangle function where you give it the center of the triangle and that'll help drive the geometry. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so here we have one iteration of our recursive function. So we have the main triangle and then the three smaller ones around it. And the idea is our triangle function is gonna be given the center of the triangle and the length of a side. And from that, we need to figure out where our points are. So where do we draw the vertices of our main triangle and then we'll also need to figure out where are the centers of the three secondary triangles and so we can begin with this point here and the x-coordinate is pretty simple it's zero so if this is the center right it's the same as the center so we offset by zero the y value gets trickier and the reason why it's tricky is it looks like it might be half the side, but that isn't true because this is the length of the side. It's half of this distance. And in order to calculate this distance, we need to use a little bit of trig. So this angle here is 60 degrees. Half that angle is 30 degrees, or because we're gonna to have to deal with radians, it's one sixth pi. And so if we take the side, times the cosine of 1 6th pi, that will give us this length, but what we want is the y value, which is actually clearly just half that length. And so we're gonna be using that formula quite a bit. This length that's half of the side times the cosine of 1 6th pi, and that gives us this length here, and that is the y value for this point, in the negative direction, and it's the y value for these two points on, in the positive direction. And then we also have to know this x distance, but that's easy, that is just one half of a side because this is an equilateral triangle, so all the sides are the same, and this distance is also one half of a side. So that solves the problem of drawing the triangle, and when we write it out in code, it'll be a little clearer. And then we have to figure out where these, the center of these other three triangles are. This one lines up here. So the X distance is again half of a side. The Y distance is half of this length. And the center of this triangle is over by half of a side but in the positive direction and the distance up is half a length. And then this triangle, the X is zero because it's lined up with our translated origin. And the Y value is one and a half of these lengths. So one length plus another half of a length. And the other thing that may not be obvious is each triangle, the sides of the triangle are half as big. So the side here is half of this side. So that gives us the geometry we need. And again, the main point is we'll calculate this length and use it to figure out where our vertices go, okay? So with that in mind, we can start programming. For the programming, what I'm gonna start with is the my triangle function, which will draw a triangle and then eventually we'll make it recursive, but we'll start with just drawing a triangle. 
and I will call it my triangle because processing has a built-in triangle function that we will take advantage of. And what we need to tell this function is the XY location of the center of the triangle and the length of the side. There we go. And as I said, I'm going to translate to the XY position in the center of the triangle and then we'll do all of our calculations from there. So we'll need to use our push and pop matrix to translate properly. There we go. And now we can draw the triangle using the geometry we drew out before. And the first thing we'll need again is that length that's going to be used to calculate where the vertices are. So there's our length. And now we can start drawing the actual triangle. So there's our first point. The x value is lined up with the origin but moved up by negative that length. There's our second vertice, so it's moved over by half the side and down by the length. And then our third vertice is positive by half a side and down by the length. And that should draw our triangle for us, so we can go ahead and test this out. And I'll begin by putting it in the middle of the screen and then let's say a side of 300. So that looks pretty good. We can maybe make the triangle a little bigger to start with, but I'll stick with this. And now we need to put in the recursive function calls. So I'm going to begin by drawing the triangle that comes under this one. So right here below it. And we need to start by making sure that we have a stopping condition. So I only want to do this if my sides are still reasonably long. And I'll just use four as that test condition. There we go. And now all I need to do is recall my triangle, but with the new triangle drawn down below. So I want it drawn underneath, and that means the x position doesn't change. And as we saw looking at the geometry, the y position is 1.5 times the length. And the size is half as large. Excuse me, except that's the side, not the size. There we go. And so now we have our recursive triangles drawn underneath our main triangle. And it's a good idea in doing recursive fractal patterns like this to do one at a time. I didn't try to do all three triangles. Let's make sure one works before we worry about the other ones. If I tried to do all three at once and they weren't correct, I'd get a mess on the screen and it'd be hard to figure out what was going wrong. So as always with programming, doing it in little steps is always a good idea. So there's my first triangle. My second one is, I'll do the one off to the left here. So the distance to the left we said was minus one half of a side and the distance up was half of that length. And then again, side times 0 0.5. And so this gives me the triangles off to the left. But of course, the triangles down below also have them drawn off to the left. So I've sort of filled in a whole half of my fractal pattern. And the other nice thing about doing this a step at a time is you can see intermediary patterns that, you know, are kind of cool all by themselves. And then for the third triangle, we can just copy this one, but it's in the positive x direction. So it's going to be over here. And there we go. There's the basic Sierpinski triangle. It's upside down from the way you often see it. And I did it that way just because it's a lot easier for me to think of the triangles as facing up. So each individual triangle faces up, which leads the overall triangle to be facing down. And once this is done, there's all sorts of different ways that you can play with it. So you'll notice that my background, there's a little bit of separation between them. It's kind of like they're exploded. And you can achieve that effect just by scaling them down a little more. So as long as I'm here, I think I'm going to make my initial triangle a bit bigger. And so I'm getting a bigger overall triangle. And then I'm going to go in and for the sides, instead of decreasing them by 50%, I'm going to decrease them by 60%. So the new sides will only be 40% as long. And now notice they don't quite fit together. 
because they're smaller. And that's part of how I got that sort of exploded look, if that's the kind of thing that you like. We can also play with whether or not we include a stroke. So removing the stroke, excuse me, capital S, gives you a different looking pattern, if you prefer that, sort of a more snowflakey like look. Another interesting thing you can do is have the hue change over time. So I'm going to put my sizes back to the original 50%, but I'm going to add in for the triangles a hue that's associated with them. So I'll begin with zero. And what I really want to do here is use the color wheel. So I need to begin by doing a color mode. So standard 360 color wheel with 100 for the saturation and brightness. So what I'm passing in is the hue. And now when I do my new triangles, I'm going to get an error because they also have to pass along the hue. And I want it to change over time. So I'm going to do the hue. Let's do plus 30 and mod 360. So if I go past the end of the color wheel, it circles around the other side of the color wheel, and then I'll just paste that into my other two triangles. There we go. And for this to work, of course, I have to put in a fill so that I'm actually using the hue. So now each triangle has a hue and then passes along a different hue along the color wheel to the next triangle. So there we go. That's kind of a nice bright color if that's what you like. This might look a little better with a darker background, so we could try doing that. So there we go. That's sort of a nice effect. So the next thing I want to do is show you that you don't have to just draw triangles. You could also, for example, put images in. And so for this, what we're going to need initially is some sort of an image with a transparent background. So you'll need to go find typically a PNG with a transparent background. And then in processing, you put it in a folder called data inside of your project. And I've already done that. I have an image called i2.png, which we'll see in a minute. And we need a P image object to store that image. So this will give us a P image object called IMG. P images are processing's way of storing images. We'll need to load that image. So this loads the image again from the data folder. And then we need to display the image. And the basic idea for displaying it, let me scroll down here a little bit, is after we draw the triangle, we'll draw the image on top of it. And so this is the basic command. It's the image function, which draws whatever image you've loaded. And I'm putting it at 0, 0. This won't quite work, however, for a couple of reasons. First of all, 0, 0 is the center of each triangle, and the image is drawn with that as the upper left-hand corner. So my image would be over to the side. And we can adjust that by changing the location of the image. The other slightly bigger problem is the image needs to be scaled to fit inside of each of these triangles. And that raises a small issue with the approach that I've taken. When I'm doing the recursion, I'm changing the side, that is how big the triangles are. It might have been a better idea, a little more general, to instead use a value here like scale, and then we could apply the scale directly to the image. I haven't done that, but it's actually okay because by using the side and connecting that to the initial size, I can use that ratio sort of as my scaling factor. Not entirely, because how much I want to scale by depends on the size of the image as well. But the basic idea is I'll use another push and pop matrix to apply a scaling factor to my image. And instead of putting it at 0, 0, I'll shift it over a little bit so it's centered. So let's take a look at how we do that. So this is the basic idea. I'm going to push on my current transformation so that I can do a scaling that only applies to the image, and then I'll pop the matrix back off so the scale doesn't apply to the triangles. For the scaling here, as I said, it's based on the side, but divided by, you might think, the initial size. And that won't quite work in this case because I have a fairly large image. So it turns out, and I know this only because I played with in advance, 
I need to do a scaling by quite a bit more to make it small enough. And then similarly, as I said, we need to shift it. So this says shift it to the left, minus is going to be to the left, half the width of the image, which makes sense because I said the issue is the image starts with the center being the upper left hand corner. So I shift to the left by half the size of the image. And then it's the same idea. We want to shift it up by half the height of the image. Excuse me. IMG is the name of the image, but it turns out this doesn't work real well because it shifts it too high for the image I have and it overlaps at the top. So instead, again, trial and error, I use a 0.35. And so depending on the size of your image, you may need to scale it differently and at least in terms of the up and down, shift it differently. But really that's all there is to it. We load an image from the data folder and then after we've drawn our triangle, we draw our image. And here we go. So there's our triangle with, I used a cat's eye drawn inside of each of them. I sort of like the pyramided eye motif. And now I want to do one more thing, but I want to do it without the images. So I'm going to delete the image part of the code. There we go. You can already start to see there's lots of ways to play with this. So you can play with, as I said, the scaling. You can play with the color. This is changing the hue. You can get some nice effects by changing instead the saturation or the brightness. You could mess around with adding a fourth triangle up above, lots of different options. But the one that I wanna show, as I said, I sort of promised we'd put our own spin on this, is to go into our translate and rotate based on the frame count and we need to generally turn this down pretty far because we're dealing with radians. So you might pause for a minute and think about what this is going to do. It's going to add a rotation. And here we go. So each triangle rotates, but that rotation is saved for the other triangles and we get this kind of spinning gear effect. The other thing that is neat about it, at least I think, is as you watch, you in a sense get very different fractal patterns as the triangles line up. So there's our original, but here's one that's coming around in a minute. Uh, let's see if we can find it, where they kind of like these triangles line up, but they're upside down. So just from doing this, you can imagine different ways of setting up the fractal patterns. Uh, maybe add some stars in the background, whatever you want. So there we go, the Sarpinski triangle with, as I said, our own little spin. Take it out and try it and see what you can come up with. Excellent. Thank you.